This is one of the most extraordinary artifacts from antiquity, a piece that remained impossible to replicate until the 20th century, the Lycurgus cup. With its painstakingly carved deep relief decorations, dynamic composition and emotional intensity of the figures, it is a masterpiece of ancient art. But its most remarkable feature is the color-changing glass, made with techniques pioneering nanotechnology 1600 years before modern times. Created in the 4th century AD, the Lycurgus cup is a rare example of a Roman glass cage cup, also known as a vas diatretum. In this type of glassware, the glass is carefully cut and ground back to form a decorative cage, attached to the body of the cup by short stems or shanks, creating the illusion that the decoration is suspended above the inner beaker. The Lycurgus cup is the only well-preserved figural example of a cage cup, with most others featuring geometric designs. Its artwork is a continuous narrative frieze that wraps around the entire vessel. The figures have been deeply undercut, demonstrating the exceptional skill of the Roman glass artists. Measuring about 16 cm by 13 cm, the cup is made of dichroic glass, appearing jade green in reflected light, but turning a translucent wine red when lit from behind. This color-changing effect is achieved by adding nanoparticles of silver and gold to the glass during production. These particles are small enough to reflect light without blocking its transmission. The cap's frieze depicts a scene from the myth of King Lycurgus, a figure from Greek mythology associated with the cult of Dionysus, the god of wine. According to the myth, Lycurgus was a Thracian king who opposed the worship of Dionysus and persecuted his followers. In retaliation, Dionysus drove Lycurgus to madness, leading to his eventual downfall. The frieze vividly captures a moment from this myth. The central figure is King Lycurgus, shown naked except for boots and ensnared by grapevines. He is flanked on the left by crouching Ambrosia, depicted at a considerably smaller scale. Ambrosia, one of Dionysus' nursemaids, was killed by Lycurgus. As she died, she turned into a vine, trapping the murderer in her branches until the god returned. Behind her stands one of Dionysus' satyrs, depicted in a human form and balancing on one foot as he prepares to throw a large rock at Lycurgus. In his other hand, he holds a pedum, or shepherd's crook. To the right of Lycurgus is a figure of Pan, a rustic god of the wild, shepherds and flocks, followed by a panther at his feet. The animal is traditionally associated with Dionysus. Though the panther's face is missing, it was presumably snapping at the king. Finally, the god Dionysus is depicted taunting Lycurgus with an extended right arm in a threatening gesture. He holds a thyrsus, the staff of his cult, and his attire reflects an eastern, possibly Indian influence representing the Greeks' beliefs about the god's origins. The calf of one of his legs is missing. A streamer draped from his thyrsus overlaps the raised foot of the satyr with the rock, completing the circular design of the cup. The depiction of the figures is dynamic, with a strong sense of movement and emotional intensity that conveys the drama of the scene. The expressions of the characters, especially that of Lycurgus, are masterfully rendered, capturing the fear and agony of the king as he is overwhelmed by the divine forces. The interior of the cup is mostly smooth, 
but behind the main figures, the glass has been hollowed out, well beyond even the main outer surface, ensuring the figures are of similar thickness to the beaker. This allows for a consistent color when light passes through, a unique feature among surviving cups. However, the area around Lycurgus's torso shows a different color from the rest of the glass. This might have been an accident of manufacture, but it was cleverly exploited by the glass cutter to make Lycurgus's rage glow even more strongly. After the lengthy cutting process, the polished finish was likely achieved through flame polishing, a risky method that could have destroyed the object. The cup was made around 290 and 325 AD, a time when glassmaking had reached a high level of sophistication. For years, scientists were baffled by its incredible color-changing quality. In fact, it wasn't until the first full studies of the cup in 1950 that it was established for certain that the material was glass and not a gemstone, which had previously been in question. It is believed that up to three separate workshops or factories were involved in the cup's production, possibly in different parts of the Roman Empire. The glass may have been created in a large block of clear glass, likely in Egypt or Palestine, which were major glass exporters. The thick, dichroic blank vessel was probably crafted by one specialist and then passed on to another workshop of expert cutters. Given the cup's rarity and complexity, it was an expensive luxury item. The secrets of its manufacture seem only to have been used for about a century. The dichroic effect is created by incorporating tiny nanoparticles of gold and silver, which were dispersed as colloids to form a silver-gold alloy within the glass. Around 330 parts per million of silver and 40 parts per million of gold were mixed into a typical Roman glass flux. In reflected light, the tiny metallic particles are just large enough to reflect some light without blocking transmission. In transmitted light, these fine particles scatter the blue end of the spectrum more efficiently than the red, leading to the observed red color. It is improbable that Roman artisans could have measured such minute quantities of gold and silver to add to the volume of the glass used to make the vessel. This suggests that the metals were likely added in higher concentrations to a larger volume of molten glass, which was then further diluted with more glass. The particles, about 70 nanometers in size, embedded in the glass, are too small to be seen with optical microscopy. Instead, a transmission electron microscope is required to observe them. At this scale, the particles approach the size of a visible light wavelength, leading to a surface plasmon resonance effect. Modern dichroic glass became available as a result of materials research conducted by NASA and its contractors, who developed it for use in dichroic filters. Likely the ancient glassmakers did not fully understand or control the process used to create this effect. The discovery may have been accidental, due to contamination from finely ground gold and silver dust. They might not have even known gold was involved, given the tiny amounts used. The gold may have come from trace amounts in the silver, as they occur together in a natural alloy, or from the gold residue left on tools or in the workshop. It is worth noting that surviving fragments of Roman dichroic glass show significant variation in color. The early history of the cup remains unknown, but it was first mentioned in 1845 by a French writer who recalled seeing it some years ago in the possession of M. de Bois. Shortly after this, the cup was likely acquired by the Rothschild family. Its excellent condition suggests that, like other luxury Roman objects, it was likely preserved above ground, perhaps in a church treasury. 
Alternatively, it may have been recovered from a sarcophagus, like other cage cups. Around 1800, the cup was fitted with a gilt bronze rim and foot, which continued the cup's vine leaf theme. These additions again suggest it may have been removed from a church treasury during the French Revolution or Revolutionary Wars. In 1862, Lionel de Rothschild lent the cup to an exhibition at what is now the Victoria and Albert Museum, after which it fell out of scholarly attention until 1950. In 1958, Victor Rothschild sold the cup to the British Museum for £20,000. For those interested in viewing this remarkable artifact, it is housed in the British Museum's Department of Britain, Europe and Prehistory, rather than the Greece and Rome Department, and is on display in room 41.